All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to West Talks on March 11th. Um, so the Water and Environment Student Talks, we aim to bring together leaders on sustainable water and environmental research from around the globe and students interested in making a difference. And uh, as you'll see in the, the map later, it's, uh, it's definitely become a global conference and that's our global seminar series and that's what we, uh, we love about this. Um, so first, the West Conference, I'll just keep plugging this uh, every week. Um, the West Conference is our, uh, the UBC Water Conference, but it's open to anyone. Um, so there's a link here and uh, I'll, I'll try to share the link in the chat afterwards, but abstracts are open until April 15th for um, presentations and posters. So again, fully virtual conference, everything about water. And West Talks is a collaboration between IC Impacts and UBC Future Waters, both of which are based out of UBC. Um, and here is the organizing committee, as always, Abhishek, Leili, Fuhar, Jaskran, Furya, and myself. Um, some, most of us are from the University of British Columbia and Jaskran is from the University of Guelph. All right. Admit those people. Okay, perfect. Here's the uh, the the map, and again, I'll post uh, I'll post this link down at the bottom in the chat as well. But if uh, if you haven't in the past week, please click on the link, and then in the top right corner, there's actually a red plus sign. Click on that, and then add where you're calling in from. So this is since January we started doing this. This is everybody who is uh, who is logged in from a West Talks, which is pretty awesome that we have such a, a global and diverse um, audience and and communication. So. All right, getting to the lineup, we're uh, we're about half, well, just over halfway through the winter 2021 lineup, and we've almost finalized the spring lineup. Um, so we'll be releasing that soon. Today is Dr. Peter Bach from EVEG um, in Switzerland, and he'll be talking about transitioning to blue-green cities. And uh, blue-green cities is something that I, I have to admit I don't know much about, but in the last two weeks, I've heard it about four times. And every time I was thinking, aha, in, uh, you know, when, when, Dr. Bach presents to us, I think I'll, uh, or I'll hopefully understand what it means. So uh, I think quite a topical and timely presentation, at least for myself, and hopefully everybody else thinks so too. Um, and as always, all of our previous West Talks are available on the IC Impacts YouTube channel, which is sent out in the weekly uh, email invite. Um, so you can go back and view any of the previous talks there. All right, and on to today's speaker, Dr. Peter Bach. Um, so Dr. Peter Bach is an interdisciplinary research scientist at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, which we know as EVEG, and an honorary adjunct research fellow at Monash University, which I recently learned was outside Sydney, I believe he said. Um, he obtained his bachelor's degree in civil engineering and a PhD in water systems modeling from Monash in 2009 and 2014, respectively. His core research focus is on the planning of blue-green systems for a wide variety of functions, from urban water services to human and ecological benefits. Dr. Bach is best known for his work on the planning support tool Urban Beats, an integrated model um, that leverages GIS analysis and water systems modeling to support the location, design, and implementation of blue-green systems. He's also involved in the International Water Association Specialist Group on Modeling and Integrated Assessment, the IWA Working Group on Modeling Integrated Urban Water Systems, and is one of the founding members and managing editors of the new IWA journal, Blue Green Systems. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Peter. Um, I will stop sharing and uh, feel free to take it away. So throughout the presentation, if you have any questions, please anyone just go ahead and type them into the chat box and Jaskaran will uh, be addressing all the questions at the end. All right, Dr. Bach, thank you and uh, welcome to West Talks. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, just checking that you see the slides. Yep, all good. So, all right, thanks for the opportunity to um, come and present and talk a bit about uh, the, I guess call it the witchcraft that I'm involved in, uh, in trying to plan our cities towards a more sustainable, um, a sustainable future. And I guess what I'm intending or hoping for with this talk is to give you a bit of an overview of, I guess, just how complex um, an issue we're dealing with when we're talking about planning cities for the future. And that it's not just, I guess, an engineering challenge, but it's also a very, um, I guess, 
a very complex challenge that involves stakeholders, uh, engaging with the right stakeholders and trying to balance the different interests uh, that we face and objectives that we have to deal with. But it goes without saying, and I can't transition slides, come on, please work, okay. Uh, it goes without saying that we're dealing with a growing list of grand challenges. So if you thought that climate change, urbanization and population growth were already a handful to deal with, we are also facing serious biodiversity loss and not to mention the pandemic that we are currently in. Now, what's very important to note is that cities are becoming a very important focal point in our future sustainable development because over half the world's population lives in cities and this is only going to increase in future. I was looking at some stats recently and mega cities with populations more than 10 million. We've had only a few in the last few years, but they are emerging and there's a prediction that by 41, uh, that there'll be 41 of them by the year 2030. The urbanization itself causes some severe alteration of our natural environment. Um, nature is built upon these connected um, connected areas that allow species to um, species to migrate, that allows water to flow and naturally infiltrate into into the ground, and really this cyclic process that is what sustains our environment. And in an urban center, which is a very different kind of, which has a very different kind of cycle associated with it, we face a number of different um, challenges, including pollution, increases in noise, uh, flood risk, as well as drought. Um, and I've sort of lived in a country that, I mean, back, back in Australia, when I lived there, we've, we've had to deal with both of these issues. And we are using our resources in a very unsustainable way and need to act upon that quite urgently. Not to mention, we're also dealing with a lot of other social issues such as crime, as well as um, urban heat islands, which we are facing more and more. The fact that extreme heat events are going to be occurring in the future, um, we need to start to deal with the, the increases in extreme heat in our urban environments because heat-related stress and heat mortality are becoming serious issues and recognized issues. So we're planning cities to try and be sustainable and be kind to nature, but we're also planning them to be livable environments so that we are comfortable in there. Um, and that's just going to become even more and more pressing with the pandemic that we're currently facing. There's been some recent thought about how we consider planning, our urban planning uh, in the COVID-19 era, and that it's sort of caused somewhat of a shock to the system uh, in how we have done urban planning to date. The not, not only that, but also the issues of traditional approaches like building compact cities to prevent sprawl. Um, these kinds of ideas are starting to become very questioned and have a lot of their limitations. One aspect that in particular emerged from some of the work I've been reading on, um, the, on urban planning in the COVID era uh, has been the role of urban parks. There are some recent papers out there that talk about how parks and green spaces have been very valuable for a lot of the residents that have been living in isolation in lockdown, uh, that they provide some a sense of reprieve uh, and provide some improvements to the mental and physical health um, especially when we are prevented from moving far from our own houses and we are, we are stuck and we are stuck in our homes. And designing with nature and designing for these urban green spaces is nothing new. And there's been a movement called the Garden City Movement that has been around since the 1900s, the early 1900s, coined by Ebenezer Howard. And it's focused a lot on linking the city with the countryside. It recognizes that there's this symbiosis between an urban center and a lot of the rural surroundings. And we see that a lot in the economic aspects of agriculture with the urban areas. If you go to a lot of small towns uh, outside major urban centers, you'll see that they're still very heavily reliant on the interactions with the rural surroundings. One thing the Garden City movement emphasized in particular is this idea of green belts, having green spaces connect various parts of the city together, allowing nature to flow through it, allowing people to access this, this, um, these green spaces for the health benefits, for the social benefits. 
Another aspect about designing with nature, we see a lot in other fields like um, like the medical sciences or in mechanical engineering. And it's this concept of biomimicry, learning from how nature does things and engineering our tools and solutions accordingly. There's a very interesting quote that I can really resonate with by Michael Polwyn, who's an architect um, who's worked on the Eden project in the UK, which was a rehabilitation project for an abandoned mine or a closed down mine. And that quote is, if we can learn to do things the way nature does, we could achieve a factor 10, factor 100, or even maybe a factor 1000 savings in resource and energy use. And it really resonates with me because we have been trying to understand nature, trying to design with nature and especially in urban water management, which is where I started my research career and is still the core of what I do. Um, we've started looking into trying to link nature up with our engineered infrastructures to try and maximize the, ben the benefits that we get and the urban water services that we need to deliver. Urban water management has evolved quite substantially over the last century. And this has been driven primarily by an increase in environmental knowledge, our socio-political awareness, um, as well as the, the needs that we need to deliver. There's a growing list of services that we face, starting with you know, cities being founded on clean water sources to provide water for drinking and sustaining life. And following that, we start to recognize the need for sanitation. In fact, one of the greatest advances in medical sciences of the 20th century was the introduction of the sanitation system, the sewer system. Uh, and it's still one of the biomedical journal's greatest, um, um, greatest achievements, uh, at least greatest, um, well, this was sort of judged by a lot of uh, readers of the journal uh, as one of the biggest medical achievements. We moved on to re recognizing that our infrastructures have altered the natural hydrological cycle and have needed to drain our cities um, of the stormwater that falls on our cities due to the, incur the, the occurrences of floods uh, and the greater increase in risk to, the, to society. Um, but that has only caused more problems in that it's polluted our receiving waterways and caused some major um, issues in water quality as well as um, degradation of the natural environment. Algal blooms, for example, deplete the oxygen in our waterways, causing fish, uh, fish kills and declines in population. Thermal pollution from stormwater runoff has also caused a lot of problems as well. And this is, rec this is recognized in our evolution towards a waterway city with a greater environmental awareness. So if I put a timeline there, you can see that it's taken a, quite a lot of evolution to come up with these basic urban water services, and we are progressing towards recognizing that we need to bring water back into a cycle to mimic that natural hydrological cycle. And thus the water cycle study was born where we start to recognize that we can harness the potential of the stormwater that falls on our cities. We can potentially recycle um, our wastewater to become, uh, to be used for garden irrigation or many other uses. And since then, in a more recent in the more recent years, we have seen the value of water beyond just providing water services, just providing sustainability goals. We recognize the need to involve the community. We recognize that water itself can deliver a range of other ecosystem services in our urban areas. The Blue Green City is sort of the natural evolution. Um, and I will sort of explain my interpretation of it. It's, I guess, an emerging concept that has taken shape in the last few years. And Blue Green City is sort of the term that I use to describe it. Um, although you've seen, I've seen different variants of it, including circular cities, the Blue Green Dream. Um, but it builds upon this idea of a water sensitive city where the focus now is no longer on just water but it's about how we can use urban water management to create a lot of other benefits, be it in energy, be it in biodiversity and any other multifunctional aspects that we can think of to make our cities more livable uh, and sustainable and especially adaptable to a lot of the ongoing challenges. Around the time waterway cities emerged, we had the concept of sustainable urban drainage systems. So recognizing that centralized major infrastructures were pretty efficient and pretty good, they're not necessarily the best solutions in all cases. And so these decentralized options 
um, decentralized management options, engineered technologies that we can implement at local or different other different scales um, emerged as the initial concept concept of sustainable urban drainage systems. Uh, around the 2000s, water sensitive urban design became uh, a widespread term, particularly in Australia, which recognizes the need to incorporate this into the urban environment. The incorporation of nature based solutions, um, working with vegetation, working with water. And we are now moving towards this concept of blue green systems. And what exactly are these blue green systems? And these are also the toolbox that we would use to create this blue green city. Well, in short, this is a visual impression of what blue green systems can encompass. And there's a number of different things, and many will call these other, you know, by their other names, such as water sensitive urban design, low impact development. In Singapore, they call it active, beautiful, clean waters. In China, they call it sponge cities. But essentially, there are a variety of systems and practices, and I should add practices is just as important as the infrastructure or systems we build, that combine blue aspects, so water, green aspects, the vegetation, and the gray elements, so any engineered uh, aspects to it, such as the piping systems, the concrete, uh, anything that we would need to create multiple benefits. Uh, the EU, the European Commission, defines it as a strategically planned network of interconnected natural and semi-natural areas. So harnessing the nature we have in our cities currently, as well as engineering natural based systems to increase that connectivity. I mentioned earlier that the urbanization fragments the landscape and that can cause some serious degradation in biodiversity and a number of other aspects. And this is really an attempt to bring that connectivity back. These systems deliver a range of ecosystem services and are inherently multifunctional. And I have some examples illustrating that um, as we progress through this talk. They are implemented through spatial planning. A lot of them are inherently decentralized, but there are also, I guess, ways to impose centralized approaches to nature-based solutions and nature-based technologies. And this is more done through the planning system and through strategic spatial planning. But ultimately, remember that the composition usually will have some form of either greenery and or water. So coming back to the blue green city, so what is it really? So we know this term, the green city, this sort of buzzword, it's about designing for sustainability, efficiency, adaptability, and resilience to a lot of the ongoing challenges. The blue aspect is really about just adding water where we start to use urban water management solutions to try and bring these benefits. Uh, and it's about holistic planning, looking at all the different aspects of planning, all the different benefits that we need to uh, deal with and we want to provide to the city uh, and using water in support of this. And there's a heavy reliance on the blue-green systems that I've mentioned just now. Some people call it blue-green infrastructure as well. There is a subtle difference and I will use blue-green systems as I progress through this. One important aspect is this idea of adaptive management. So this is the need to adapt your solution as you learn more about how the solution responds, how the system responds to the solution, uh, and to understand based on the performance of your system, what needs to be done to ensure that you're delivering your sustainability uh, benefits and your ecosystem services. The concept is it was inspired by many other concepts, including the water sensitive city, as I've mentioned, um, as well as the circular economy. And there's a huge EU cost action project called Circular City, which is ongoing uh, and really delivering a lot of innovations in that field. And a few years ago, the Blue Green Dream Guide was published as well, which outlines a lot of the similar concepts that I'm presenting here. But enough of buzzwords, really, what is it visually? And this is my attempt at really illustrating what it looks like. And so if we want to create a blue green city, one big aspect is about planning, long-term planning. The solutions are not short fixes. It requires a strategic approach that looks at what the city currently looks like and uses a combination of new technologies as well as retrofit options to create over a time span of say 30 to 50 years, an idealized version of a city that is sustainable, adaptive and resilient. This is an example, a hypothetical example of the city of Zurich where I live. And this is what I sort of perceive as it being a blue green city in 30 to 50 years. Now, what does it entail? And there's really three levels that I distinguish of solutions. You have solutions that are at the planning and policy and regulation level, 
You have solutions that go down into spatial planning and look at the urban form and alter the urban form, as well as the individual technologies that are then uh, located across the urban landscape to deliver these benefits. Examples include, for example, green space connectivity provisions, putting in regulations that require existing green areas to be connected up so that you form a continuous path so that humans can migrate through it you know, so we can use that for recreation. People like to cycle into work. And so this is one way of providing that recreational um, bicycle paths, but also importantly for animals so that species can migrate safely through the urban environment. You can also look at sprawl and density controls. There's no optimal solution for how dense or how sprawl the city should be, but depending on the context, those might become very important to manage, particularly if you're looking at the inner city versus the uh, urban, the peri-urban areas. You may also impose zoning restrictions to protect um, existing natural areas or prevent the encroachment onto natural areas. In terms of spatial planning, um, we have solutions that really look at altering the urban form. These include looking at urban greenways, linear parks, um, which is part of that green space connectivity I was mentioning earlier, but also creating waterfront spaces that are natural, that act both as a filter for stormwater before it enters receiving waterways, as well as providing an amenity uh, service to the people living there. Uh, I'm sure you guys can think of many different examples of um, nice green waterfront areas with a lot of different um, gathering spots for the urban populations um, across the world. Then we also have strategically planned room for the river, room for the lake that we like to refer to it as. So this is really targeting the littoral zone or the riparian zones to allow buffer. Uh, this can act as flood protection, but also as area to filter out incoming stormwater so that once again it protects the urban waterways uh, and finally at a more i guess uh, at a more fragmented level the the idea of putting in urban pocket parks to allow areas where people can gather so that it's not too far from them it's in walking distance uh, provides them that mental health and physical benefit but also provides some refuge for animals that are trying to migrate through the urban uh, the urban dense uh, densely built up areas Finally, we've got the technological aspects. Really, it's about individual systems that are strategically placed for their various purposes. This could include local water harvesting treatment systems. You could be putting green roofs and facades on major buildings to provide that insulation, you know, energy savings or carbon sequestration in certain areas that really need it. Uh, and these technologies can be designed and engineered according to the local context and implemented um, to complement a lot of the other solutions. I think key message here is, you have different solutions at different scales. And if you want to create that blue-green city in an efficient way, you need to be able to harmonize all three levels. I want to go into my research for a bit just to give an insight of how I've been dealing with that. Um, and I, I really deal with an interdisciplinary range of topics that span urban water, urban planning, and the social sciences. Core to my research is really blue-green systems and how we plan them. Um, but if we're going to make some change and the impact that I feel I want to make, then the focus has to be on really looking at how they can deliver these multiple benefits. And so I've taken um, different, I've, I've looked at the different sciences across uh, urban livability and ecology, integrated urban water systems, as well as urban dynamics. Um, my tool of choice is integrated modeling and geographic information sciences uh, and using those for stakeholder engagement. Some fun facts. Just to show you, yes, that is a guy with a virtual reality headset. I have delved into that as well as a means of stakeholder engagement, but I'm not going to talk a bit about that. But if you're interested, feel free to contact me. And I'm obsessed with acronyms, so you may see a few interesting ones. Urban Beats was mentioned earlier. Really, it's this idea of planning support systems. So using models to support a planning process, rather than predicting, we're using it to experiment with ideas, test hypotheses, and quantify, most importantly, uh, quantify these benefits so that we can support decisions that have to be made around blue-green systems. Models themselves, they provide that evidence-based science to guide planning. So it's that experimentation and exploration. And this is where the Urban Beats model, which stands for the Urban Biophysical Environments and Technology Simulator, comes in. This was my PhD, and I've since developed it further from just a stormwater management tool to an integrated planning support system. 
It's GIS based and it incorporates stakeholder preferences. Other tools that I've also worked with um, include things like Santo. I'll mention that briefly because it's also quite relevant and we're working on integrating that into Urban Beats, uh, as well as you, some of you may have heard of the Water Sensitive Cities Toolkit. Uh, this is a tool that was headed by one of the major research centers in Australia on water sensitive cities. So I'm going to talk about technologies, the spatial planning, and then the urban development. So going through those three levels, giving you a bit of a snapshot. So at the technology level, we look at suitability of different technologies. So we're talking about swales, bioretention systems, uh, constructed wetlands. And Santo, as I mentioned before, is a tool that allows us to use it using GIS data to try and map out where suitable locations are for different types of systems. Um, this is an example of what we did for a large area across Melbourne where we looked at where suitable systems can be placed. And this is quite um, this is quite essential because often you've got a whole selection of technologies, but you're not sure where exactly we can locate them. And really there's two parts to the design and implementation of these technologies, the location, and then finally the actual design. How big should it be? Does it fit and where should it go? Um, so Santo itself is one step towards that where we really try and investigate the locations and this is based on a GIS multi-criteria decision analysis where we use ecosystem service uh, services uh, as the basis for it, indicators that are mapped out and we try and layer them together and look at the outcomes for that. From that point on we also look at where we can put systems. Often a technology doesn't work in isolation, we need to plan out entire schemes. If you have a particular development, how are you going to achieve your different objectives? You'll have different spaces available for different decentralized systems, and this is where the core of Urban Beats really sits. And this is an example of what we've done for an urban development in Melbourne, Australia. And there's a paper there to give you a bit more of an idea. But this is where we took a master plan and we took the targets that they've set for themselves and we tried to plan out an entire stormwater management scheme for a range of urban water services. Um, and so looking at the model itself and the reference there gives a bit more detail on how we validated it and how we um, sort of made sure that it was giving us realistic results. Looking at this, you can see compared to the real plan that the model itself is giving really interesting insights into what's possible and where. But it's not just about urban water services, it's really about moving beyond that to all the other benefits. And this is where the connectivity aspect becomes much more important. Urban Beats models urban water related processes, but also goes beyond that and looking at green spaces and green space connectivity. So we model four different types of connectivity currently, including the water flow paths for drainage, flooding, catchment management, green space networks. So how clustered, how fragmented are the green spaces and how close are they to each other? Are there opportunities to connect them up? We look at the proximity of where people live to green spaces. And this is also important for equitable access, amenity, health and recreation. Um, and finally, the functional connectivity. So how easy it is for species of different types to move through the landscape. And this is an example that we've illustrated for the city of Zurich and the Zurich Uster region. So it's a slightly larger area. But it shows that we can create these different connectivity maps and layer them on top of each other to start identifying where the key pinch points are, where the key hotspots are, and where the opportunities lie. Just going into the, the amenity aspect a bit more, models like this allow us to also start comparing different cities with each other. And here's an example of how we compare Zurich with downtown Melbourne. Planning, urban planning often looks at allocation of green space, how much green space we need to provide to the residents um, when we're designing new environments. And the model allows us to also assess, well, what is the current state of it? How accessible are the current green spaces and should we do something to improve it? And this often then hints out, well, we can do something with blue-green infrastructure in these locations um, because there is also a need to deliver that, uh, the urban water services as well. Apart from the green spaces and um, recreation and health, urban heat is becoming a very big issue and we are looking into trying to, uh, trying to model the urban microclimate. With models like Urban Beats, which look at the entire city, one of the key challenges is to try and map out the spatial uh, dimension of urban heat 
in a very rapid way so that we can explore different scenarios. And this is just one example where we're taking a fast model that was developed to simulate urban heat uh, and to try and identify the hotspots in addition to what I've shown you already and use that as opportunities to then plan out what are the most suitable systems. In terms of the biodiversity, I showed you the connectivity map briefly. Um, this is really part of a much larger project where we're trying to rely on the sciences in the ec ecological research um, to map out where species move, how they migrate th through the environment. And this is using a number of different methods that were developed in the respective disciplines, uh, such as multidimensional trait analysis, species distribution models, and most importantly, circuit theory. Uh, so there's a tool called Circuitscape, which we're currently investigating and how we can link it to Urban Beats to then uh, map out where the pinch points are for species movement through the environment. We're doing this on frogs. This is our species of choice, and it's given us quite a lot of laughs as well because they've got funny names and it's quite, it's quite amusing to see. Um, also because there's the running joke that Airbach works with water and the VSL is the forestry institute, so we need to match the, you know, the dry and the wet. But the idea is with these kinds of maps, how can we then bridge the connectivity? Urban environments represent resistances to animals. How can we then use the vegetation and use the water to try and lower this resistance and promote that movement, which is important for genetic diversity and therefore biodiversity enrichment. So a lot of opportunities that we can identify in the spatial planning, in the technological space. But one final aspect in that is really about the urban development. And we need to be able to guide that because what a study that we did showed in a small town that even subtle changes in urban growth can still have significant impacts on the urban hydrology, on the state of the town. This is a small town that we looked at in Australia and rural Australia, which gets flooded quite significantly. And you can see the picture on the left with that sign almost completely inundated. Um, we looked at New, newly developed areas, but we also looked at the existing areas and modeled this in SWIM to see what the what the changes are. Now, this was a sort of a precursor to a much more interesting question, which I'm now exploring, which is, well, urban development itself can be modeled. Urban growth itself um, follows a number of different processes, and it's based on the suitability of the land to build, the access to existing areas, zoning restrictions, how the neighborhoods interact, uh, and also the resistance to change and some randomness. This is an example simulation of the city and how it might grow within 20 years, and this is the population map. But when we start looking at these individual factors, we start to find that you know, a number of different aspects, in particular, even blue-green aspects, parks, waterways, can influence how we decide where to put new land. Um, and this is an example of accessibility. You know, what is the attractiveness of certain areas based on their accessibility to different spaces? Uh, this is a little catchment that we ran in Melbourne to try and map out these accessibility relationships. And this then brings in a lot of different uh, implications like planning overlays, land uptake, density controls that can be um, that can be optimized to try and develop the city. So not just putting in technologies, but developing the actual urban growth towards a more sustainable form. So this is, for example, a comparison between how this attractiveness would look like if we were focused on all the transport oriented, so transit oriented aspects versus all the blue green oriented aspects. And you can see the maps of where the darker areas, which are the attractive areas are, they look quite different as we increase the weight that these factors have. So how do we then plan it? How do we manage that? And this is something that I'm really excited to explore in the coming, in the coming months, coming years even. But despite all these solutions, despite all this interesting insight that we're gaining, we are still faced with a truly wicked problem, a uh, collaborative approach that is essential because using Switzerland as an example, we're dealing with many different spatial scales, national, in Switzerland's case, cantonal, but think of it as the states, uh, regional, so the different cities, and as well as the local, so the urban. And along with all this are a number of different stakeholders that have a number of different interests, objectives. And apart from identifying all the different spatial features, 
that I've sort of demonstrated already through all the different slides, as well as the functional features in the biodiversity, we have to also be aware of a lot of the social aspects, the connectedness, how different stakeholders talk to each other, what their interests are, where the conflicts are and then how that at the end relates back to the urban environment. And this is really a huge institutional challenge. Doing some work with stakeholders in Australia, we've really found that you know, with the multiple objectives, stakeholders and organization, we still face inadequate regulatory frameworks and capacity even to do blue-green systems. Uh, people perceive it as yet another asset to be managed and that there's no real driver top down and people are really trying to just do this from the bottom up. So municipalities are taking it upon themselves to try and innovate. Different consulting companies are trying to bring in new ideas in the planning. There are some ideas of how we can you know, change policy towards this, but we're still facing quite Quite a lot of um, quite a lot of resistance. Some people champion the ideas, but they are faced against people who are quite antagonistic and still want to do things in the traditional way. And we need more community stewardship to um, to try and drive this forward. So bringing this all together, this is where I'm hoping to go in the next few years. And there's a project I'm trying to get up and running called Blue Green Alive, which is trying to involve a number of different um, different collaborators from across the world and trying to bring all this together into four major case studies. And it's really about the modeling aspects of it and using Urban Beats, making it very operational so that we can then work with stakeholders together to experiment with new ideas of how we can build blue-green cities. So that was a quite a broad overview of what I wanted to sort of give you, give you an insight about blue-green cities. Um, but how do we transition forward? It's an interdisciplinary journey. Um, there's no two ways about it. There's a lot of different um, pieces of science that we need to bring together and we need to be able to work across the disciplines. And I've been very fortunate and thankful to have a lot of great collaborators that I've been able to learn a lot from. So definitely huge, hugely important. Planning the Blue Green systems, it's really about balancing the skills, coming up with flexible solutions. And there's a need to better understand and quantify the multiple benefits that it can provide. We recognize them and we need to find ways to be able to then work with these benefits and understand when do we provide certain benefits. And this includes not just water, urban water management services, health and amenity or biodiversity, but also things like energy and carbon sequestration, uh, as well as a number of other aspects that are slowly being recognized. Long-term planning must win over short-term quick fixes. Otherwise, people perceive this as just yet another asset to manage. And this is where adaptive management can help, this ongoing learning, this ongoing refinement of the solutions. And finally, one thing that has been lacking a lot is we know how to build these systems, where to put these systems, but we need also ongoing monitoring and maintenance to, mo to make sure these systems function and deliver the benefits that they promise. And hopefully that is something that picks up in the coming years as we have improvements to sensor technology, improvements in understanding and the more greater willingness to engage in this aspect. So with that, I would like to finish this talk. Uh, thank you for your attention and I look forward to taking your questions.